All right, hey everybody. I, I am Seth Larson. I work at the Python Software Foundation as the security developer in residence. And I'm gonna be talking about, oh, thank you. I'm gonna be talking about uh, embracing the differences, securing open source ecosystems where they are, and hopefully provide some more context and some stories and some reasons why it's really hard to, from a security point of view, which is very high level and working to secure multiple ecosystems concurrently, it's really hard to, once you get feet on the ground and try to actually secure the individual ecosystems. So starting off, I, I see this pattern all over the place and I'm sure everyone else does too, where there's, every time that there's like a software ecosystem, it seems to kind of fall into this template of you have some sort of platform or runtime that's centralized to the ecosystem, a repository of software that's optional to install. Usually it's installed via command line and then there's some way to propagate vulnerabilities with ID information and data, some metadata. And so lining up these three ecosystems that obviously are very different, they come, they have very different use cases, a language ecosystem, something for defining continuous integration workflows and an operating system. If you line those up, they still work out in this pattern, right? You have all of these things, they fit in those, in those boundaries. So you might be thinking to yourself like, okay, because they fit into this template, obviously there's gotta be so much similarity between all of these that it should be easy to apply a lot of the things that are high level outside of these ecosystems down into those individual ecosystems, right? And it turns out that there really is. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of ways that you can solve a problem once and then duplicate it elsewhere. Actually, there was a talk just, I think an hour ago by uh, Zach Steinler and, and Jack Cable, specifically about the repository uh, row here where repositories in particular have a lot of commonalities between them. But something that to, to keep in mind is that a lot of times it, it, it does depend. There's, there's so much different about all the other stages and even repositories in particular are, can be different even though you know, there's, there's so much similar between them. So let's talk about the differences today because I'm, they did an awesome job talking about the similarities. Let's talk about differences. Okay. So, back to simpler times. I, I wrote this talk before XZ happened. <laughs> so, we, we didn't use the most recent example. But, so a little blast from the past. Uh, LibWebP happened and I did a whole bunch of work as a part of LibWebP, uh, specifically for responding to the vulnerability for the Python ecosystem and trying to see how hard is it for an entire ecosystem to respond to this sort of centralized vulnerability that's really common in dependencies. And so I wrote a whole blog post about all the work. We're not gonna talk about what actually what happened. We're gonna talk about, okay, we've done all the work, all the maintainers have patched their projects and then made releases. Now what? What do we do now? And a lot of people probably already know what happens now. We, we try to get users to know that they need to now take action. So this is like the typical flow for how a scanner that's doing vulnerability scanning will turn like some sort of lock file or an SBOM that has a list of software IDs, so it's like names and versions, and turn that into some like alerts. And it'll usually use a vulnerability database with some records in it. And what tends to happen is it'll try to match software IDs onto something that's on the record, right? And so to do that, we need to make sure that whatever is over on the far left side there in the lock files or SBOMs actually is in the records themselves, otherwise no match can occur, right? And then you don't end up getting an alert, and that's not great because then users are acting as if there is nothing for them to do, right? So you don't wanna have that negative signal even though like it's, it's gonna be really hard for us to now do this because that CVE record already exists. And if you have done any amount of work with CVEs, maybe you have read the CNA rules, you can't create a new CVE, so you have to end up adding a new software ID to an existing CVE. So how do we do that? Uh, a typical flow for that is to use CPEs and so CPEs, a common platform enumeration, uh, creating a new one is kind of tough and a lot of open source projects don't have one or if they do have one, they have no idea what it is because this is a completely external process that's kind of happening to them. And so because of this, these projects, it, it's hard for me to expect that these projects who have no knowledge about how CVE or CNAs or CPE works in the back end can like do this. So I'm being paid full time to do this but if we want like people that are doing this as a part time or as a hobby, if they want to participate in the system at all, that, that's a really big knowledge gap. And you can see the number there. There's, there's so many projects on PyPI. 
I guarantee you that a very small percentage of those actually have a CPE. And so for that system to scale manually, getting a new CPE includes emailing NVD. Uh, it, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna work for, for that sort of thing. It's, it makes it really difficult to add your software ID to an existing CVE. So don't worry about the smallness of the text. This is from one of the projects that I ended up working closely with the maintainer to patch for LibWebP. And so something about Python, and here's we're getting into some differences here. Uh, Python doesn't have releases. You may think that it does, but it actually just has files, and all of those files, which are completely disconnected from one another, happen to have the same version. That's a release in Python. And so what, what are the, there's a lot of implications of that, but in particular for this case, one of the implications was is that only some of those files have libwebp in it. Okay, so I did my scan and Mac OS and Linux and the source don't actually have it, but the compiled wheels for Windows do have it because installing libwebp on Windows is really frustrating. And so the maintainer helpfully included libwebp alongside it. So there you go, right? On Mac OS and Linux, it's way easier to get libwebp. And so it's part of the installation instructions. You can install it with your package manager of choice. And so what are the implications of that, right? It's only in Windows artifacts and it's been that way since the beginning. So only if you're installing these files, are you actually needing to take action in terms of upgrading this Python dependency? So let's see what an effect that has. Okay. So 95% of all the downloads are not affected, and no, none of those users need to take any action. Only 5% of downloads are for Windows. And so it, it becomes really difficult for me to say, okay, now we'll, we'll just mark every single release that's ever happened for this package as vulnerable to this, and everyone needs to upgrade. That's, that's just more alerts that end up meaning nothing. And so it'd be really nice to be able to provide some contextual, ecosystem-specific information into this record, into this ID. You can't do that with CPE. Uh, if, you were on the, if you actually owned the CVE itself, you might be able to put something in there, but if you're just adding yourself to the CVE, I don't think there's a great way to be able to capture the fact that, okay, if you're using these files, if you're installing these files, you're vulnerable, right? So you can't end up doing that. So it would be really great if our software ID system was able to provide this context, and then once that context gets provided, if the manual vulnerability scanners end up being able to action on it and then not provide alerts for the 95% of people that don't need to do anything. So if we're gonna completely disregard, we're gonna, we're gonna go full XKCD uh, standards here and say, okay, well, what, what would a perfect software ID look like? And, so we have a few things like, you know, the ecosystem, where'd you get it from, the index, uh, some, some of you among us are, have namespaces, like if you're NPM, you have namespaces, PyPI doesn't have that. You have project names, versions, ranges, file, okay, lots of stuff. And one thing to note is that it is almost impossible to explain all of these things in one standard. So if you were to say, okay, it's time to unify everything, it just wouldn't be possible. I've written an entire blog post about how quirky Python versions in particular are. You can put the whole digits of pi in, into a version, it would be totally fine. Um, and so you don't want to write a standard that, that merges all of them together. So what do we do instead of that? Well, we can, we can just use the standards that already exist, right? Like all of these language ecosystems, all of these programming languages, all of these operating system uh, package managers, they all have their own standards on what's acceptable. And so this is kind of the secret sauce. I'm sure a lot of you already know where this is going. Package URLs, this is the secret sauce for that standard is we'll, we'll just use their standards. And so package URLs, they, they very, very quickly provide a, like a basic structure and then they just delegate. They say, okay, PyPI, just you're following their standards now, <laughs> which is great because it means that you can provide all this contextual information. So you can say, okay, see there's that weird version number that doesn't occur anywhere else in any other programming language, but it does in Python and it's great to be able to put that there because that's, that's the real truth. And same thing with the file name there. So I, I abbreviated it because it's quite long, but being able to put the file name in the actual like ID itself would make it so that if a scanner knew how to interpret that, it could look at a lock file or a virtual environment or a Docker file and say, okay, you didn't install this exact file, so then I don't need to alert on this because that it's just not affected, right? And luckily, I'm really excited for this. It, CVE schema 5.1 includes some support for package URLs. Woo! 
So this is more, and don't worry about it, don't have to read all this. This is just to be imposing to say that it's more than just software IDs. I just focus on software IDs because I love package URLs. Um, but so along this journey, even though we didn't cover that much ground, right, we, we kind of uncovered like lots of little stuff like, oh, the file, the file that got installed matters for Python. There's not, there's not really a concept of a release. And you know, non-Python bundle dependencies, that's totally normal for every, a lot of other ecosystems too. But like file names being metadata, like Ruby also has that problem, Python has that problem. Uh, th there's just a whole bunch of things that, that make it really difficult to, from a high level design, secure policies, secure tools, secure workflows. And this is just from trying to fix one vulnerability in one component. And it's a lot more than just software too. So ecosystems are comprised of projects, but they're also comprised of individuals, human beings, right? And human beings have problems that are way harder to fix than software problems. And so <laughs> taking, taking that into account, when, whenever you're designing something or interacting with communities, it, it's, it goes a long way. And knowing that like maintainers themselves are not the only people in the ecosystem that you actually have to care about. You also have to care about users, which are in a way kind of stakeholders of maintainers, right? So they have this exact same relationship where they want, in theory, they want their users to be happy and they don't want users to be showing up in issue trackers upset. So one of the stories here uh, to, to provide some concrete, con like, concrete evidence of this is uh, Rust and Python are becoming a little bit more frequently together. And so one of the most recent or one of the oldest projects that started to actually adopt this is the cryptography package. So cryptography is one of the most critical security critical packages in the Python ecosystem. And they were working for years to adopt Rust in a way that users wouldn't end up being massively impacted, right? They made tons of noise about it, multiple years of development. They were talking about it very publicly. And then one day they ended up making the release. And the day that they made the release, there was a huge firestorm from users. And it, in theory, everyone could have agreed that yes, adding Rust and memory safety to a security critical package is a great thing. But users were frustrated because it ended up having to change their workflows. They had to install a Rust compiler if they were installing from source. And because it upset their workflow, even that simple step of requiring a Rust compiler is quite difficult, right? It has a whole bunch of other implications as well. And so you need to really think about everyone, not just maintainers, also the users themselves, how changes or new proposals end up affecting open source ecosystems. So here's another thing, history, expectations. All of these software ecosystems are not point in time, right? Python's been around for a really long time. Pre-compiled package binaries have been around for 20 years and 14 years of wide adoption when the wheel format became pretty regularly used. So 40, almost 40% 40 of downloads uh, from the Python package index include pre-compiled binaries. And that is scary in the wake of XZ, but it's because of how like, the, the backdoor was actually ended up smuggled in with a binary test data format. And so it can be really scary to be like, okay, well, let's, should, we, should we move away from pre-compiled binaries? It would be really difficult to move away from this. Um, if in this, this is just like all downloads. If you look at actual individual projects that are using like C and Fortran and Rust, it's like up in the 98 or more range of downloads that are using these pre-compiled binaries. And so asking users to like change all of this, like in any sort of timeline is, is quite difficult to imagine. Um, so obviously we would love to move towards, a lot of ecosystems end up having made a good decision and being source first, but it, I think this is kind of where Python is right now, and it will be for quite a long time, and how can we, how can we move forward to a more secure space in the wake of XZ with this as our hopeful keeping this workflow around? Because obviously users like it. It's hard for me to imagine Python being as popular in spaces like computing and AI and graphics technologies if this were not like a core feature of Python. I don't think it would be as popular if that wasn't the case. So it's hard to say, let's just take it away. So now, these are the things that I hope you take away from this. So one of the most important things for me is that a lot of the solutions that we're gonna be coming up with from like a security perspective, because everything that we're doing from a security perspective is super high level. I think we need to take more of an approach of 
flexibility and not expecting silver bullets to be a thing, not expecting for this tool or this workflow to fix everything. Uh, and when we are trying to design those sorts of things to be able to be able to use in like tons of different ecosystems, making them super flexible, relying on work that's already been done in those ecosystems, it just goes a huge way. I mean, one of the I would say one of the core things that made SigStore so interesting is because it is so flexible, and that flexibility has made it so that it, it can pop up everywhere in different ecosystems. And I think the other thing that I see a lot is when solutions get proposed that aren't solving all of the problems, this is the other side of it, when pro they get uh, proposed that don't solve all the problems, they end up getting criticized because they don't solve all the problems. And I'm kind of arguing that that's actually a good thing because they're really targeted for the ecosystems or the problems that they're solving. The next thing is sustainable open source security. So security and sustainability kind of go in hand in hand. It's really great when they line up. When they don't line up, it, it can be really, really difficult to cause change in an ecosystem. Um, so this is stuff like hiring full-time staffing is, is really, really great for this because it means that you know, I can go out and move the needle with all of my time that I have available as opposed to kind of nickel and diming, adding little stuff on the edge wherever I can. Uh, but this is also things like, okay, we're thinking about what the person's actually gonna need to do to adopt this technology or what, what is this gonna change about how people interact with open source. So lowering the bar, compare CPE to package URLs, right? Package URLs are all intrinsic and you can just immediately uh, take advantage of them. And the last step I have is, so knowledge sharing community. One of the powers of open source is that because it is open, right, we can immediately share knowledge super, super widely and a lot of this is super useful for everyone that is participating even if they're not in that exact same ecosystem. One of the first things that I did even before this role um, what in the security space was to just try salsa with Python and then after that happened I just like wrote down everything that went wrong and then publicized that and I that document ended up being pretty useful for the salsa folks and I really would love to see more of that right do stuff try it out whatever breaks or whatever doesn't work for your ecosystem write it down and then share it widely with the community and then let's try to work together to solve those problems so that we can end up adopting security practices more widely and that's all I have for you